Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, so, happy to have the third talk of the day. Ronen Eldan will tell us about uh, the Gaussian noise stability deficit. Thank you. Uh, so far, I really enjoyed the talks in this seminar. All right, so uh, we're talking about uh, the Gaussian noise stability deficit. Let's, start, let's try to understand what Gaussian noise stability means. And our starting point is the actu actually the Gaussian isoperimetric inequality. Let's see what that is. So our setting in this whole talk is just Rn equipped with the standard Gaussian measure. This is its density. And the Gaussian surface area of a subset of Rn will just be defined as the integral over the, over the boundary of the set of the Gaussian density with respect to the n minus 1 dimensional Hausdorff measure. So this is roughly how much the Gaussian measure increases in first order when we take an epsilon extension of the set. Now, the Gaussian isoperimetric inequality proved in initially by Borel and sudakov tsilerson somewhere in the 70s says roughly that isoperimetric minimizers are half spaces. In other words, out of all sets whose volume is some prescribed number, the set which minimizes the surface area is just a half space. Now, what we'll consider is some extension of this isoperimetric inequality, which is an inequality concerning to noise stability. So let's first try to understand what we mean by Gaussian noise. So we say that x and y are jointly standard Gaussian with some correlation rho, which is a parameter between 0 and 1. If either, so one way to define it is the coordinates of x and y are all normal variables and the covariance matrix is just such that each one is just a standard Gaussian and the corresponding x1 and one, y1 say have correlation rho between them. So, and that's true for each coordinate separately. Another way to define it equivalently is the following. We take three independent star standard Gaussians and we say that x and y have this common component root rho times z1. And then we add an independent component to each. So to x we add this and to y we add an independent copy of this. So we can just think about this as being the actual thing we want to measure and this as being the noise. So x and y are the same thing with if rho is close to 1, we have some small noise which distincts between x and y. And we define the noise stability of a subset A of Rn as just the probability that both x and y are in A. So we should, uh, maybe it would have been natural to divide this by the product of probabilities that x and y or in A, in some sense, it measures how stable the set is to noise. Given that x was already in A, y is some noised version of x, what's the probability? How likely is it that y is also in A? So that's the Gaussian noise stability. Now, a theorem of Christel Borel from the from mid-80s says that, well, Half spaces are not only isoperimetric minimizers, they also maximize the noise stability. So for all sets with a given Gaussian measure, if I want to maximize the correlation between x and, x and y both being in A, uh, I want to take this, my set to be a half space. 
um, why is this an extension of the isoparametric inequality? So it's not hard to uh, see that when rho is very close to 1, when the noise is very small, the probability that x will be in A and y will be in A in the complement of A is, is just more or less proportional to the surface area, right? Because x and y have to be kind of close to each other, and this is just a calculation that the second, the first order of the uh, of change with respect to rho of this uh, stability is just proportional to the surface area. So we, so this extends the isoparametric inequality, and I there okay. This result has uh, many applications. It kind of connects many areas of mathematics. It's relevant in approximation theory, in rearrangement inequalities, in concentration in high dimension related inequalities. I just want to mention one discrete application to this, to the so-called majority stableist theorem. So this is due to uh, Elhanan Mosel, O'Donnell, and Olishkevich. And that, that's kind of a discrete version of the same thing, which states the follows. So as, uh, the following, so if we have a function defined on the discrete cube, so we can think about this function as an election system. It takes the votes of n different people, and the outcome is just 0 or 1, who won the election, say. And we're thinking about uh, this point in the cube as just a uniform point in the cube. And then we, we, we can consider noise. So we can imagine, for example, that the people counting the votes sometimes make mistakes. So there is a probability epsilon for each vote being counted that they regenerate the vote randomly. And now let's say that we want to maximize the noise stability so we don't want this, this noise, these errors, to affect the final outcome. And what the theorem says roughly is that the best way to avoid this, uh, to, to get a stable thing under, under a condition of low influences. So this roughly means that each voter does not have a big effect on the outcome. I don't want to precisely define what that means, but it turns out that the, best, the most stable thing is just the majority function, so we just have to sum them all up and check whether they're bigger than some constant. Uh, my, so the best real life application that I could come up with to Borel's theorem is the following. So say we are collecting street cats. So we're wandering in the street and we see cats which have different properties like their size and height and how loudly they meow. So these are all properties in the real line that have Gaussian, uh, well, it's, uh, I guess we could expect them to have ga a Gaussian distribution. And let's say that our goal is to, we don't want to break up families of cats. So if two cats are siblings, I want to kind of get a high correlation between the events that I collect them both. So I want to maximize the expected number of cats which are family members that I collect. And let's say we have, uh, so our space has two parameters, say what's the weight of the cat, is it light or heavy? And what's the complex argument of the cat, is it an imaginary cat or a real cat? And I'm starting to collect more and more cats. And in the end, I want to kind of decide how I, well, what's my crit criteria for keeping the cat or not keeping the cat? And it turns out that I want to choose criteria based on some uh, half space like this. If the properties are not correlated, it's easy to see that it will be a coordinate half space. Otherwise, it will be some, uh, I, I have to do some PCA probably and 
it'll be some kind of uh, half space. All right, so we have, we know that half spaces are the most stable sets. Now we can ask ourselves, it, is this fact robust? Namely, if we know that a set is almost as stable as, as its corresponding half space, as the half space which has the same measure, is this set in some sense, th does it look like a half space? Or we could ask the same thing about the isoperimetric uh, question. If a set is, this, if a surface area of a set is almost like that of, a, of the corresponding half space, does the set in some sense look like a, a half space? So more formally, we would like to say something like, given that the deficit between the noise stability of the set A and the noise stability of the of a half space with the same measure is small, is it true that the distance between the two sets is small with respect to some metric? And what metrics would one consider? So a nat natural, one natural metric to consider is just the total the variation distance, so just the measure of the symmetric difference. And another measure one could consider is just the Wasserstein distance between the restrictions of the Gaussian measure onto the sets. And the first result we have in this direction is by Elhanan Mosel and Joe Neiman, uh, which says the following. So we define delta of A to be the minimum among all half spaces of the Gaussian measure of the symmetric difference between A and this half space. On, of course, sorry, I, I, I also want the measure of this half space to be equal to the measure of A. So this is some kind of total variation distance between A and the set of all possible half spaces. Uh, and the result uh, says that this uh, quantity can be controlled by the deficit. So if the deficit is very, very small, in some sense the set is close to a half space. And this is true up to a constant which depends only on the measure of my set and on this parameter rho. Uh, in particular, it implies that the equality case can only, I mean, we could only have equality if our set is a half space up to some uh, probability zero uh, change. Now, okay, so this robust inequality admits uh, numerous applications, basically wherever we, we have, uh, wherever Borel's theorem is used almost, we also get some robust version, in particular uh, for the majority stablest theorem, we know uh, a robust version. So basically, major the majority function is essentially the only function which minimizes, uh, which maximizes the stability. And this, this also implies, for example, so this could be seen as a quantitative version of Arrow's theorem, for those who, of you who know what that is. Um, so it implies, for example, so, so this implies that the only way to minimize the probability of non-rational outcome in an election is by taking the majority function under some uh, low influence assumptions. By taking rho to one, in some cases, we get also a robu robust isoperimetric inequality. And, okay, I, I don't want to gi give details about this. Uh, they conjectured that this exponent four over here could be replaced by two. And I just want to comment that there is a slightly older, robust, uh, robust, uh, ro robustness result for the isoperimetric inequality. Uh, 
by uh, Cianci, Fusco, Maggi, and Pratelli. I guess I said that okay from 2011. Cianci, all right. Okay. Um, now let's let's go back to this metric, and I want to try to understand. Maybe there's a better way to capture the distance between A and, and H. I want to try to convince you that at least when we're talking about noise stability, this metric might miss something. And to do that, I want to construct a very simple example. And the example looks like this. So. We're going to construct two sets which are slight perturbations of just the measure one half, half space on the line. So let's consider the real line. And, I, and let's say that this, this is zero. So the measure of all of this is one half. And I want to take here an, an interval of measure epsilon and call it I2. And I'll, call this thing I1. So the half space is just I1 and I2. Now I want to take this interval and just move it slightly to the right and call it I3. And so, okay, so my, the set H would just be these two things. That's the original half space. And a perturbation of H, which I call A, will be just I1 and I3 instead of I2. But now I want to consider another perturbation. Instead of taking I3 to be here, I take this eps epsilon mass and move it a constant distance. So I put it here. So let's say that this point is the inverse Gaussian cumulative distribution function of 3 over 4. So this is 1 half, and I put it in 3 over 4, and let's call this I4. And the set B will be just I1 and I4. Now, it's pretty clear that the distance, well, the total variation distance between both these sets and the half space is just epsilon, so delta of these sets is the same. But on the other hand, let's try to understand what the noise stability of A and B are. Maybe I'll just, so A is the blue set. And B will be the black set. OK, so to know what the noise stability of A is, I have to consider the probability that both x and y are in A. So that's the probability that both x and y are in I1, plus the probability that x is in I3 and y is in I1, conditioning on x being in I3. I have factor 2 here because I can also replace x by y. And I have uh, an O of epsilon square, which is the probability that both x and y are in the small interval. Now, I have exactly the same thing for b. So if I want to compare the deficit between these two guys and the stability of h, well, OK, this suggests we have to look at the difference between these two terms. Now, it's not so hard to realize that given that x is in I3, the probability that y is in I1, the noised version of x, is, well, it's not so different than the same probability, but given that x was in I2. I didn't move I2 so much to get I3. And if you calculate this, you, you, will, you will see that actually the difference is of order epsilon. On the other hand, if rho is not very close to 0, it's also easy to see that given that x is in R4, when I say that x is here, 
This diminishes the probability that y will be here by, by a lot. I mean, well, at least by some constant factor. And if I plug in these two facts to the, the previous formulae, what I get is that the, the stability of A is the stability of H, but, well, minus something of the order epsilon square, while the stability of B is much smaller. Because I moved this interval over here, I get something of order epsilon. And, well, this suggests that this metric doesn't capture what's going on so well. Somehow I want to capture not only how much mass I moved, but how far I moved it. So this gets us to the uh, main theorem I want to introduce, and it's the following. So let's try to define a different metric. Namely, what we do is, is this. We take our set A. We look at all possible have spaces whose measure is the same measure as that of A. And we, look, we measure the distance between the centroid of H and the centroid of A. So it's pretty clear, OK, so if this is the origin, if A is somewhere here, H will probably look like this. And it's not hard to see that this measures how far I moved the mass and not only how much mass I moved. And I guess this result could convince you that this metric is somewhat more natural. What we get with this metric is that, again, up to constants that depend on the measure of A and on rho, this deficit can actually be bounded from both sides by the same quantity. Well, up to some logarithmic factor. So in some sense, if we only care about knowing the deficit up to constants, it's actually enough. We, we, don't, we don't have to calculate what the noise stability of the set is. We just have to calculate this quantity, which is, I, I, I'm sure you'll, you'll agree with me that this is simpler to calculate. It's basically just a one-dimensional thing. It depends only on the marginal of A onto a certain direction, right? Uh, now, this uh, theorem has a few corollaries. So first of all, the conjecture I mentioned is verified since delta square is controlled by this metric epsilon. It gives an improved uh, robust Gaussian isoparametric inequality because, well, by taking rho to 1, it turns out that you can also get the limit case. Uh, this is another example of what you could get by this inequality. So for example, if you know that a set has a pretty good surface area measure, then, well, when rho is close to 1, this deficit will be small, which will imply that epsilon is rather small. And now you could use this fact with a larger value of rho and plug your estimate on epsilon here, and this will give you some estimate on the noise stability in terms of the surface area. So somehow we know that the noise stability cannot get much worse as we increase rho by using this uh, two-sided thing. Any questions so far? Because at this point, I think I'll move to some ideas from the proof. Uh, I don't have right, uh, square is less than that for me. Okay, so th this is, uh, well, I, I haven't explained why, but, uh, but basically the, the extremal example in this case, and it's not so hard to prove it, is, is the set A defined here. If you take the mass and move it very closely, you'll see that, okay, for A, delta square is of the order epsilon, 
And it's not hard to see that this is the worst case you can be. You just project it onto one dimension and somehow play with it. Okay, this is a very easy fact, but not, not, maybe not immediate. Okay? <laughs> uh, glad to help. Okay, so uh, let's uh, talk about some ideas uh, of the proof. So what I'll do is mainly I'll prove Borel's result. This is a novel proof of Borel's result uh, based on stochastic calculus. And somehow uh, in this proof, we'll see how the centroid of the set comes up. So I'm not going to really prove the robustness thing, but hopefully I'll give an idea about how to do it. All right. So we're interested in this quantity, the stability of A, which is that just the probability that X and Y are in A. If we plug in the definition of X and Y, it's the probability that root rho Z1 plus root 1 minus rho Z2 in A, and the same for Y, where Z2 and Z3, well, Z1, Z2, and Z3, I remind you, are just independent standard Gaussians. What we can do is definitely we can take expectation over Z1, and inside the expectation, we can condition on Z1, right? We, we did nothing here. And well, when we condition on Z1, it's clear that this guy and this guy will be independent, right? So we can, instead of just checking that they're both in A, we'll just check that the first one is in A and take the square of the probability. At this point, what we do is the following. Let WT be just a standard winner process or Brownian motion. It's clear that W time rho, the joint distribution of W time rho and time one is the joint distribution of these two guys, right? So what I can do is I, I can replace all of this expression by W1 and instead of conditioning on Z1, I'll just condition on whatever happened until time rho. So what we get is that the stability is just the probability that a Brownian motion at time one is in A conditioned on the filtration at time rho squared. Until now, we didn't really do anything. This encourages me to take this probability to look at the Dub martingale the probability that W1 is in A conditioned on FT, this thing, and give it a name, let's call it MT. So we're actually interested in the expectation of M rho square. Now, since MT is a martingale by definition, right, it's a dub martingale, this expectation by Ito's formula is just the expectation of the quadratic variation of the martingale between time zero and time rho. So all we're interested is in is how much this martingale really varies. And in order to know what the quadratic variation is, what we want to do is try to calculate just its Ito differential. To do this, what we do is Okay, so MT is just this probability. Let's, this probability is just the integral of some measure on A, and this measure is just the measure of W1 conditioned on WT. Now, W1 conditioned on WT is just the Gaussian measure centered at WT. We already went, we, we already used T of our time interval zero, 01, which leaves us one minus t seconds to go, right? So it's a Gaussian whose variance is one minus t. And mt will just be the integral of this density ft over our set A. So now we have a process of measures, ft, which begins with a standard Gaussian. The Gaussian, its, its center moves according to a Brownian motion, 
as the actual Gaussian shrinks, right? The variance shrinks, and at time one, we end up with some delta measure. And we want d of mt, which encourages us to calculate d of ft, right? So if we calculate d of ft, ft, well, we have a formula for it. So we can just use Ito's formula to calculate the differential. It turns out we get the following thing. I don't want to uh, bother you with the actual calculation, but I do want to give you some intuition about what we get, which is pretty simple. We get that the, the, this, so this process measures varies in infinitesimal time, what happens is really we take our measure ft and we multiply it by a linear function, which is equal to zero on the center, if x is equal to wt, it's equal to zero, and has a random gradient. So basically our process is we start with a Gaussian measure and we keep multiplying by linear functions with uh, random slopes, I mean randomly distributed directions, and this kind of makes sense because, well, if we think about it in one dimension, we multiply by many functions which look like this, one plus epsilon x, and many functions which look like one minus epsilon x, we have many cancellations, each cancellation looks like one minus epsilon square x square, and we, if we take this to some high power, we get something like e to the minus some constant x square, which is a Gaussian density, right? But not all of them cancel. Some of them, I mean, we have, in the end, we're still left with some terms which don't cancel out, and this gives us an exponential which actually moves the center of the Gaussian, right? So this is, I mean, this is a very simple fact, but it turns out to be very useful. And the reason it's, it's useful is the following. So, well, if we want to know what d of mt is now, we take, we just integrate d of ft, and this is a linear function. If, and if we integrate a linear function over the set A, well, all we care about is where the centroid of A is located, right? If the centroid of A is far from the origin, this will change the mass of A a lot. And if it's at the origin, well, multiplying by a linear function will just do nothing. So the center of mass actually appears here. But the center of mass with respect to what? Well, with respect to some random measure, FFT. But, well, it's not so hard to just change variables to get, well, ft is some, is some Gaussian, and of course I can make it a standard Gaussian by just moving the center and dividing by the standard deviation. And if we do this, we just get the actual Gaussian center of mass of a set. But the set is not exactly the set A, it's just the set A I, where, which I moved a bit and, well, I shrinked, a bit. actually I inflated a bit, right? So in order to know, I, I'll remind you that we're interested in the quadratic variation of this process. Well, it'll be big if those vectors are big, right? At any given time, I'm taking this vector and I'm multiplying it by an infinitesimal Gaussian, right? So we finally get that the, the quadratic variation difference is just the norm of the center of mass of, uh, of the Gaussian center of mass of some translate of my original set A and if we use the same change of variables, we actually find that the measure of this set with respect to, to which I'm integrating is just my martingale mt. So at each point in time, 
I have a, I moved my set A somewhere so that its Gaussian measure is exactly empty, and the, the quadratic variation is just how far the center of mass is from the origin. I have five more minutes, I think, right? We started five minutes late. All right, so what we want to do now is to compare the quadratic variation of the process on A, which was an arbitrary set, to the quadratic variation of the same process on a half space whose measure is equal to the measure of A. So let's take a half space H which satisfies this and define exactly the same process. Let's call it NT instead of MT. And I want to I want to see what the quadratic variation of NT is. Here we make the simple observation that if we started from a half space, the set will always be a half space, right? If we move a half space and shrink it, it remains a half space. So the the analogous expression to this would just be the same thing, but note that in case of a half space, all of this thing will only depend on the value of the dub martingale, namely, we have the martingale nt and the quadratic variation of nt is just some quantity, is just some fun function on, of nt. What is this function? We take a half space whose measure is nt and we look at its centroid and measure how far it is from the origin. And now we have, we, we, now, well, we just observe one very simple fact. And the fact is that if I have two sets which have the same measure, so I have the set A and a half space whose measure is the same as that of A, then the centroid of H, let's say the origin is somewhere here, then the centroid of H will always be more far away from the origin than the centroid of A, right? Because to get from A to H, I have to take this mass and put it here and, well, it's just a monotone, one-dimensional thing. This is a pretty obvious fact. And this is actually the only point in the proof where we have some inequality. So by using this inequality, what we see is that, okay, given that MT and NT are the same, we know that this quantity must be bigger than this quantity. So the quadratic variation of mt is always smaller than, well, the same thing we get for nt. So we have two diffusion processes and we know that, well, when they are equal, one of them moves faster than the other. Does that, I, well, that doesn't exactly tell us that the quadratic variation of nt will be bigger than this, uh, that of mt. We still have some work to do. What we can do is, well, one thing we can do is we couple mt and nt by saying, okay, I'm up to some time change, they are both Brownian motions. Let's make them live on the same probability space by just saying that they are the same Brownian motions. And then the inequality we just saw just means that given some, given the time of the Brownian motion, the inner clock of MT moves slower than the inner, inner clock of NT. And this, well, the, with this coupling, it's easy to see that the quadratic variation of MT will be dominated by then that of NT, which finishes the proof, right? If we take expectation here, we have an inequality. And actually, this gives us a stronger fact, we have a stochastic domination between these things, which gives us information about higher moments, which in itself it has uh, some more applications. I, I just have to mention that, well, at least integer moments were already known. The inequality was already known by, in a paper by Mossel and O'Donnell, but okay, this is a new proof of this. So this just gives us the inequality and uh, let me 
just for one minute, in one minute, try to give you brief ideas about how to prove the robustness. So to do this, we have to say, okay, we know that the process nt is ahead of nt, of nt is ahead of mt, but by how much? So we know that whenever the Berry centers, the, 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 those distances are quite different, nt kind of accumulates a four, mt becomes lagged after nt, but well, this, this metric epsilon just tells us something about this difference at time zero, and we wanna say that somehow, well, uh, we wanna say that given that it's large at time zero, it kind of remains large for quite some time, and to do that, what we, well, we kind of take the second derivative of what's going on. We take the Ito derivative, Ito differential of this process epsilon t, which turns out to be dictated by the behavior of some random matrix which this process is related to, and we can analyze this random matrix. Well, it's, it's kind of a stochastic random matrix. We can analyze it with uh, some spectral tools and uh, Talagrand's transportation entropy and equality is kind of a central tool in the analysis. And in the half a minute I have left, I just want to advertise that, okay, this kind of stochastic equation, well, we, we uh, it was pretty simple for us to derive. We just took a very natural process and uh, differentiated it. But we can actually, given some initial measure mu, we can actually define a new process using these stochastic measures. So if the initial measure is not a Gaussian but, but something else, we can still somehow follow the, the same method and give and get some kind of uh, a stochastic evolution on the space of measures. And for example, if we start with the uniform measure on the cube, on the discrete cube, but embedded in Rn, this gives a new direct proof of the majority stableist theorem with a slightly stronger version. The conditions we need, this is joint work with Elhanan Mosel, the conditions we need are slightly weaker. And it turns out these equations turn out to be a pretty useful tool in high dimensional convex geometry. Um, yeah, I guess I'll finish here. <laughs> Any other questions? <coughs> Any other questions? <coughs> So there is.